Chess by Stefan Zweig is a captivating novella that delves into the intense psychological drama of a fateful chess match. Set on a luxurious ocean liner in the 1920 hours, the story follows the unexpected encounter between an Austrian champion chess player, Mirko Chantovic, and an unknown passenger, Drive B, who challenges him to a game. As the match unfolds, tensions rise, revealing the depths of human ambition, obsession, and intellect. Stefan Zweig masterfully explores themes of isolation, genius, and the pursuit of mastery in this gripping tale of strategy and psychological warfare. Through vivid prose and intricate character development, Zweig draws readers into the mesmerizing world of high-stakes chess, where every move carries profound consequences. Chess is a timeless masterpiece that continues to captivate audiences with its intricate storytelling and profound exploration of the human psyche. Whether you're a chess enthusiast or simply a lover of great literature, Stefan Zweig's chess promises an unforgettable journey into the minds of its characters and the complexities of the game they play. Stefan Zweig Chess The usual last-minute bustle of activity reigned on board the large passenger steamer that was to leave New York for Buenos Aires at midnight. Visitors who had come up from the country to see their friends off were pushing and shoving. Telegraph boys with caps tilted sideways on their heads ran through the saloons calling out names. Luggage and flowers were being brought aboard. Inquisitive children ran up and down the steps, while the band for the deck show played imperturbably on. I was standing on the promenade deck a little way from all this turmoil, talking to an acquaintance, when two or three bright flashlights went off close to us. It seemed that some prominent person was being quickly interviewed by reporters and photographed just before the ship left. My friend glanced that way and smiled. Ah, oh, you have a rare bird on board there. That's Chantovic. And as this information obviously left me looking rather blank, he explained further. Mirko Chantovic, the world chess champion, has been doing the rounds of America from the east coast to the west playing in tournaments, and now has off to fresh triumphs in Argentina. I did in fact remember the name of the young world champion, and even some of the details of his meteoric career. My friend, a more attentive reader of the newspapers than I am, was able to add a whole series of anecdotes. About a year ago, Chantovic had suddenly risen to be ranked with the most experienced masters of the art of chess, men like Elekine, Capablanca, Tartakawa, Laska and Bogoli Bov. Not since the appearance of the seven-year-old infant prodigy Zashevsky at the New York Chess Tournament of 1920 to had the incursion into that famous guild of a complete unknown aroused such general notice. For Chantovic's intellectual qualities by no means seemed to have marked him out for such a dazzling career. Soon the secret was leaking out that, in private life, this grandmaster of chess couldn't write a sentence in any language without making spelling mistakes, and as one of his peaked colleagues remarked with irate derision, his ignorance was universal in all fields. The son of a poor South Slavonian boatman, whose tiny craft had been run down one night by a freight steamer carrying grain, the boy, then twelve, had been taken in after his father's death by the priest of his remote village out of charity and by providing extra tuition at home the good father did his very best to compensate for what the taciturn, stolid, broad-browed child had failed to learn at the village school. But his efforts were in vain. Even after the written characters had been explained to him a hundred times, Mirko kept staring at them as if they were unfamiliar, and his ponderously operating brain could not grasp the simplest educational subjects. Even at the age of 14 he still had to use his fingers to do sums, and it was an enormous effort for the adolescent boy to read a book or a newspaper. Yet Mirko could not be called reluctant or recalcitrant. He obediently did as he was told, thatched water, split firewood, worked in the fields, cleared out the kitchen, and dependably, if at an irritatingly slow pace, performed any service asked of him. But what particularly upset the good priest about the awkward boy was his total apathy. He did nothing unless he was especially requested to do it. He never asked a question, didn't play with other lads, 
and didn't seek occupation of his own accord without being expressly told to. As soon as Mirko had done his chores around the house, he sat stolidly in the living room with that vacant gaze seen in sheep out at pasture, paying not the least attention to what was going on around him. While the priest, smoking his long country pipe, played his usual three games of chess in the evening with the local policeman, the fair-haired boy would sit beside them in silence, staring from under his heavy eyelids at the checkered board with apparently sleepy indifference. One winter evening, while the two players were absorbed in their daily game, the sound of little sleigh bells approaching fast and then even faster was heard out in the village street. A farmer, his cap dusted with snow, tramped hastily in. His old mother was on her deathbed. Could the priest come quickly to give her extreme unction before she died? Without a moment's hesitation, the priest followed him out. The policeman, who hadn't yet finished his glass of beer, lit another pipe to round off the evening, and was just about to pull his heavy boots on when he noticed Mirko's eyes fixed unwaveringly on the chessboard and the game they had begun. Well, would you like to finish it? He joked, sure that the sleepy boy had no idea how to move a single chessman on the board correctly. The lid looked up timidly, then nodded and sat down in the priest's chair. After fourteen moves the policeman was beaten, and what was more, he had to admit that his defeat couldn't be blamed on any inadvertently careless move of his own. The second game produced the same result. Balaam's ass, cried the priest in astonishment on his return, and explained to the policeman, whose knowledge of the Bible was less extensive than his own, that a similar miracle had occurred two thousand years ago when a dumb creature suddenly spoke with the voice of wisdom. Despite the late hour, the priest could not refrain from challenging his semi-illiterate pupil to a duel. Mirko easily defeated him too. He played slowly, imperturbably, doggedly, never once raising his lowered head with its broad brow to look up from the board. But he played with undeniable confidence. Over the next few days neither the policeman nor the priest managed to win a game against him. The priest, who was in a better position than anyone else to assess his pupil's backwardness in other respects, was genuinely curious to see how far this strange, one-sided talent would stand up to a harder task. Having taken Mirko to the village barber to get his shaggy, straw-blonde hair cut and make him reasonably presentable, he drove him in his sleigh to the small town nearby where he knew that the calf in the main square was frequented by a club of chess enthusiasts with whom, experience told him, he couldn't compete. These regulars were not a little surprised when the priest propelled the red-cheeked, fair-haired fifteen-year-old, in his sheepskin coat turned inside out and his high, heavy boots, into the coffee house, where the boy stood awkwardly in a corner, eyes timidly downcast, until he was called over to one of the chess tables. Mirko lost the first game because he had never seen the good priest play the Sicilian opening. The second game, against the best player in the club, was a draw. From the third and fourth games on, he defeated them all one by one. As exciting events very seldom happen in a small South Slavonian provincial town, the first appearance of this rustic champion was an instant sensation among the assembled notables. They unanimously agreed that the prodigy absolutely must stay in town until the next day, so that they could summon the other members of the chess club, and more particularly get in touch with that fanatical chess enthusiast, old Count Simchik, at his castle. The priest, who now regarded his pupil with an entirely new pride, but although delighted by his discovery didn't want to miss the Sunday service which it was his duty to conduct, declared himself ready to leave Mirko there to be tested further. Young Chantovic was put up in the hotel at the chess club's expense, and that evening set eyes on a water closet for the first time in his life. On Sunday afternoon the chess room was full to overflowing. Mirko, sitting perfectly still at the board for four hours on end, defeated opponent after opponent without uttering a word or even looking up. Finally a simultaneous match was suggested. It took them some time to get the untaught boy to understand that a simultaneous match meant he would be playing on his own against all comers. But as soon as Mirko grasped the idea he quickly settled to the task, went slowly from table to table in his heavy, creaking boots, 
and in the end won seven out of the eight games. Now earnest consultations were held. Although this new champion did not, strictly speaking, belong to the town, local pride was all afire. Perhaps the little place, its presence on the map hardly even noticed by anyone before, could have the honor of launching a famous man into the world for the first time ever. An agent called Collar, whose usual job was simply to lay on chantoises and female singers for the garrison's cabaret, said that if there were funds available to cover a year he was ready and willing to have the young man expertly trained in the art of chess by an excellent minor master whom he knew in Vienna. Count Sanchik, who in sixty years of playing chess daily had never encountered such a remarkable opponent, immediately signed an agreement. That was the day when the astonishing career of the boatman's son took off. Within six months Mirko had mastered all the technical mysteries of chess, although with one curious reservation, which was frequently observed and mocked in chess playing circles later. For Chantovic never managed to play a single game of chess from memory or blindfold, as they say in the profession. He entirely lacked the ability to draw up his battlefield in the boundless space of the imagination and always needed to have the black and white board with its 64 squares and 32 chessmen tangibly present. Even at the height of his international fame he always travelled with a folding pocket chess set, so that if he wanted to reconstruct a championship game or solve some problem, he had the position visible before him. This defect, trifling in itself, showed a lack of imaginative power and was discussed in the inner circles of chess as heatedly as if, in a musical context, an outstanding virtuoso or conductor had proved unable to play or conduct without a score open in front of him. However, this curious quality did not delay Mirko's stupendous rise in the least. At seventeen, he had already won a dozen chess prizes, at eighteen he was champion of Hungary, and at the age of twenty he finally captured the world championship. The most audacious of champions, every one of them immeasurably superior to him in intellectual talents, imagination and daring, fell victim to his cold, tenacious logic, just as Napoleon was defeated by the ponderous Kutuzov, or Hannibal by Fabius Cunctator, of whom Livy says that he showed striking signs of apathy and imbecility in his childhood, so it was that the illustrious gallery of Chas Grandmasters, who unite in their ranks all kinds of intellectual superiority, who are philosophers, mathematicians, whose natures are calculating, imaginative and often creative, found their company invaded for the first time by a complete stranger to the world of the mind, a stolid, taciturn, rustic youth from whom even the wiliest of journalists never succeeded in coaxing a single word that was the least use for publicity purposes. It was true that what Chantovic withheld from the press in the way of polished remarks was soon amply compensated for by anecdotes about his person. For the moment he rose from the chessboard, where he was an incomparable master, Chantovic became a hopelessly grotesque and almost comic figure. Despite his formal black suit, his ostentatious tie with its rather flashy pearl teepan, and his carefully manicured fingers, in conduct and manners he was still the dull-witted country boy who used to sweep the priest's living room in the village. To the amusement and annoyance of his chess-playing colleagues, he clumsily and with positively shameless impudence sought to make as much money as he could from his gift and his fame, displaying a patty and often even vulgar greed. He travelled from town to town, always staying in the cheapest hotels. He would play in the most pitiful of clubs if he was paid his fee. He let himself be depicted in soap advertisements, and ignoring the mockery of his rivals, who knew perfectly well that he was unable to write three sentences properly, he even gave his name to a philosophy of chess that was really written for its publisher, a Kenny businessman, by an obscure student from Galicia. Like all such dogged characters, he had no sense of the ridiculous. Since winning the world tournament he regarded himself as the most important man in the world, while the knowledge that he had defeated all these clever, intellectual men, dazzling speakers and writers in their own field, and above all the tangible fact that he earned more than they did, 
turned his original insecurity into a cold and usually ostentatious pride. But how could so rapid a rise to fame fail to turn such an empty head? Concluded my friend, who had just been telling me some of the classic instances of Chantovic's childish impudence. How could a country boy of 21 from the Bennett not be infected by vanity when all of a sudden, just for pushing chessmen about a wooden board for a little while, he earns more in a week than his entire village at home earns chopping wood and slaving away for a whole year? And isn't it appallingly easy to think yourself a great man when you're not burdened by the faintest notion that man like Rembrandt, Beethoven, Dante or Napoleon ever lived? With his limited understanding, the fellow knows just one thing. He hasn't lost a single game of chess for months. So, as he has no idea that there are values in this world other than chess and money, he has every reason to feel pleased with himself. These comments of my friends did not fail to arouse my lively curiosity. I have always been interested in any kind of monomaniac obsessed by a single idea, for the more a man restricts himself the closer he is, conversely, to infinity. Characters like this, apparently remote from reality, are like termites using their own material to build a remarkable and unique small-scale version of the world. So I did not conceal my intention of taking a closer look at this strange specimen of an intellectually one-track mind during the twelve-day voyage to Rio. However, you won't have much luck there, my friend warned me. As far as I know, no one has ever yet managed to extract the faintest amount of psychological material from Chantovic. For all his severe limitations, as a wily peasant and shrewd enough not to present himself as a target, by the simple means of avoiding all conversation except with fellow countrymen of his own background, whom he seeks out in small inns. When he feels as in the presence of an educated person he goes into his shell, so no one can boast of ever hearing him say something stupid, or of having assessed the apparently unplumbed depths of his ignorance. In fact, my friend turned out to be right. During the first few days of our voyage, it proved completely impossible to get close to Chantovic without being actually importunate, which is not my way. He did sometimes walk on the promenade deck, but always with his hands clasped behind his back in that attitude of proud self-absorption adopted by Napoleon in his famous portrait. In addition, he always made his parapetetic rounds of the deck so rapidly and juckily that you would have had to pursue him at a trot if you were to speak to him. And he never showed his face in the saloons, the bar or the smoking room. As the steward told me in confidence, he spent most of the day in his cabin, practicing or going back over games of chess on a large board. After three days I began to feel positively irked by the fact that his doggedly defensive technique was working better than my will to approach him. I had never before in my life had a chance to become personally acquainted with a chess grandmaster, and the more I tried to picture such a man's nature, the less I could imagine a form of cerebral activity revolving exclusively, for a whole lifetime, around a space consisting of sixty for black and white squares. From my own experience, I knew the mysterious attraction of the royal game, the only game ever devised by mankind that rises magnificently above the tyranny of chance, awarding the palm of victory solely to the mind, or rather to a certain kind of mental gift. And are we not guilty of offensive disparagement in calling chess a game? Is it not also a science and an art, hovering between those categories as Muhammad's coffin hovered between heaven and earth? A unique link between pairs of opposites, ancient yet eternally new, mechanical in structure, yet made effective only by the imagination, limited to a geometrically fixed space, yet with unlimited combinations, constantly developing, yet sterile, thought that leads nowhere, mathematics calculating nothing, art without works of art, Architecture without substance but nonetheless shown to be more durable in its entity and existence than all books and works of art. The only game that belongs to all nations and all eras. Although no one knows what God brought it down to earth to vanquish boredom, sharpen the senses and stretch the mind, where does it begin and where does it end? Every child can learn its basic rules. Every bungler can try his luck at it. 
Yet within that immutable little square it is able to bring forth a particular species of masters who cannot be compared to anyone else. People with a gift solely designed for chas. Geniuses in their specific field who unite vision, patience and technique in just the same proportions as do mathematicians, poets, musicians, but in different stratifications and combinations. In the old days of the enthusiasm for physiognomy, a physician like Gaul might perhaps have dissected a chess champion's brain to find out whether some particular twist or turn in the grey matter, a kind of chess muscle or chess bump, is more developed in such chess geniuses than in the skulls of other mortals, and how intrigued such a physiognomist would have been by the case of Chantovic, where that specific genius appeared in a setting of absolute intellectual lethargy, like a single vein of gold in a hundred weight of dull stone. In principle, I had always realized that such a unique, brilliant game must create its own matadors, but how difficult and indeed impossible it is to imagine the life of an intellectually active human being whose world is reduced entirely to the narrow one-way traffic between black and white who seeks the triumphs of his life in the mere movement to and fro, forward and back of thirty-two chessmen, someone to whom a new opening, moving night rather than pawn, is a great deed, and his little corner of immortality is tucked away in a book about chess a human being, an intellectual human being who constantly bans the entire force of his mind on the ridiculous task of forcing a wooden king into the corner of a wooden board, and does it without going mad. And now, for the first time, such a phenomenon, such a strange genius, or such an enigmatic fool was physically close to me for the first time, six cabins away on the same ship, and I, unlucky man that I am, I whose curiosity about intellectual matters always degenerates into a kind of passion was to be unable to approach him. I began thinking up the most ridiculous ruses, for instance, tickling his vanity by pretending I wanted to interview him for a major newspaper, or appealing to his greed by putting forward the idea of a profitable tournament in Scotland. But finally I reminded myself that the sportsman's tried and tasted method of luring a capercaillie out is to imitate its mating cry. What could be a better way of attracting a chess champion's attention than to play chess myself? Now I have never been a serious chess player, for the simple reason that I have always approached the game light-heartedly and purely for my own amusement. If I sit at the chessboard for an hour, I don't do it to exert myself. On the contrary, I want to relax from intellectual strain. I play at chess, literally, while other, real chess players work at the game. But in chess, as in love, you must have a partner. And I didn't yet know whether there were other chess enthusiasts on board besides the two of us. Hoping to lure any of them present out of hiding, I set a primitive trap in the smoking room by acting as a decoy and sitting at a chessboard with my wife, although she is an even weaker player than I am. And sure enough, we hadn't made six moves before someone passing by stopped. Another man asked to be allowed to watch, and finally the partner I hoped for came along. His name was McConnor and he was a Scot, a civil engineer who, I heard, had made a great fortune drilling for oil in California. In appearance he was a sturdy man with pronounced, angular cheekbones, strong teeth and a high complexion, its deep red hue probably due, at least in part, to his lavish consumption of whiskey. Unfortunately his strikingly broad, almost athletically energetic shoulders were evidence of his character even in a game. For this Mr. McConnor was one of those men obsessed by their own success who feel that defeat, even in the least demanding of games, detracts from their self-image, used to getting his own way without regard for others, and spoilt by his very real success. This larger-than-life, self-made man was so firmly convinced of his own superiority that he took offense at any opposition, seeing it as unseemly antagonism, almost an insult to him. When he lost the first game he was surly, and began explaining at length in dictatorial tones that it could only be the result of momentary inattention. At the end of the third, he blamed the noise in the saloon next door for his failure. He was never happy to lose a game without immediately demanding his revenge. At first this ambitious determination amused me, 
Finally, I took it as no more than the inevitable side effect of my own aim of luring the world champion to our table. On the third day my ruse succeeded, although only in part, whether Chantovic, looking through the porthole, had seen us at the chessboard from the promenade deck, or whether it was mere chance that he honored the smoking room with his presence I don't know, but at any rate, as soon as he saw us amateurs practicing his art, he automatically came a step closer, and from this measured distance cast a critical glance at our board. It was McConnor's move, and that one move seemed enough to tell Chantovic how unworthy of his expert interest it would be to follow our amateurish efforts any further. With the same instinctive gesture one of my own profession might use in putting down a bad detective story offered to him in a bookshop, not even leafing through it, he walked away from our table and left the smoking room. Weighed in the balance and found wanting, I told myself, slightly irritated by his cool, scornful glance, and to vent my annoyance somehow or other I said, turning to McConnor, the champion doesn't seem to have thought much of your move. What champion? I explained that the gentleman who had just passed us and taken a disapproving look at our game was Chantovic the chess champion. Well, I added, would both get over it and be reconciled to his illustrious scorn without breaking our hearts. The poor must cut their coat according to their cloth. But to my surprise my casual information had a completely unexpected effect on McConnor. He immediately became excited, forgot about our game, and his ambitious heart began thudding almost audibly. Had had no idea, he said, that Chantovic was on board. Chantovic absolutely must play him. He had never in his life played a champion, except once at a simultaneous match with forty others, even that had been extremely exciting, and he had almost won then. Did I know the champion personally? I said no. Wouldn't I speak to him and ask him to join us? I declined, on the grounds that to the best of my knowledge Chantovic wasn't very willing to make new acquaintances. Anyway, what could tempt a world champion to mingle with us third-rate players? I shouldn't have made the remark about third-rate players to such an ambitious man as McConnor. He leaned back, displeased, and said curtly that for his part he couldn't believe Chantovic would turn down a civil invitation from a gentleman, had see to that. At his request I gave him a brief personal description of the chess champion, and the next moment, abandoning our chess board, he was storming after Chantovic on the promenade deck with unrestrained impatience. Yet again, I felt there was no holding the possessor of such broad shoulders once he had thrown himself into a venture. I waited in some suspense. After ten minutes McConnor came back, not, it seemed to me, in a very good mood. Well, I asked. You were right, he said, rather annoyed. Not a very pleasant gentleman. I introduced myself, told him who I was. He didn't even give me his hand. I tried to tell him how proud and honored all of us on board would be if he'd play a simultaneous game against us. But he was damn stiff about it. He was sorry, he said, but he had contractual obligations to his agents, and they expressly forbade him to play without a fee when he was on tour. His minimum was to $150 a game. I laughed. I'd never have thought pushing chessmen from black squares to white could be such a lucrative business. I hope you took your leave of him with equal civility, but McConnor remained perfectly serious. The game's to be tomorrow afternoon at three, here in the smoking room. I hope we won't be so easily crushed. What? Did you agree to pay him to hundred and fifty dollars? I cried in dismay. Why not? Sest Sunmire. If I had toothache and there happened to be a dentist on board, I wouldn't ask him to pull my tooth out for nothing. The man's quite right to name a fat fee, the real experts in any field are good businessmen too. As far as I'm concerned, the more clear-cut a deal is the better. I'd rather pay cash than have a man like Mr. Chantovic do me a favor and find myself obliged to thank him in the end. And after all, I've lost over $250 in an evening at our club before and without playing a champion. It's no disgrace for third-rate players to be beaten by the likes of Chantovic. I was amused to see how deeply I had wounded McConnor's amour proper with my innocent remark about third-rate players. But since he was minded to pay for this expensive bit of fun, 
I had no objection to his misplaced ambition, which would finally get me acquainted with that oddity Chantovic. We made haste to inform the four or five gentlemen who had already proclaimed themselves chess players about the forthcoming event, and so as to be disturbed as little as possible by people passing by. We reserved not only our table but the one next to it for the coming match. Next day all the members of our small group had turned up at the appointed hour. The place in the center of the table, opposite the champion, was of course taken by McConnor, who relieved his nervousness by lighting cigar after large cigar and glancing at the time again and again. But the world champion, as I had already thought likely from what my friends said about him, kept us waiting a good ten minutes, thus heightening the effect when he appeared. He walked over to the table with calm composure, without introducing himself a discourtesy which seemed to say, you know who I am, and I don't care who you are, he began making the practical arrangements with dry professionalism. Since there were not enough chessboards available on the ship for a simultaneous match, he suggested that we all of us play him together. After every move he would go to another table at the far end of the room, to avoid disturbing our deliberations. As soon as we had made our move, and since unfortunately there was no little bell available on the table, we were to tap a glass with a spoon. He suggested ten minutes as the maximum time for deciding on a move, unless we preferred some other arrangement. Of course, we agreed to all his suggestions like shy schoolboys. The draw for colors gave Chantovic black. He made his first move still standing there, and immediately moved away to wait in the place he had chosen, where he leaned casually back, leafing through an illustrated magazine. There's not much point in describing the game. Of course it ended, as it was bound to end, in our total defeat as early as the 24th move. In itself, there was nothing surprising in a world chess champion's ability to sweep away half a dozen average or below average players with one hand tied behind his back. What really depressed us all was the obvious way in which Chantovic made us feel only too clearly that it was with one hand tied behind his back he was defeating us. He never did more than cast an apparently fleeting glance at the board, looking past us with as little interest as if we were inanimate wooden figures ourselves, and his insolent manner instinctively reminded us of the way you might throw a mangy dog a morsel of food while turning your eyes away. With a little sensitivity, I thought, he might have pointed out our mistakes or encouraged us with a friendly word. Even after the match, however, that inhuman chess automaton said not a word after checkmate, but waited motionless at the table to see if we wanted another game with him. I had risen to my feet, helpless as one always is in the face of thick-skinned incivility. To indicate with a gesture that now this financial transaction was completed the pleasure of our acquaintance was over, at least for my part, when to my annoyance McConnor, beside me, said hoarsely, a rematch. I was quite alarmed by his challenging tone of voice, in fact, at this moment McConnor gave the impression of a boxer about to lash out rather than a gentleman in polite society. Whether it was the unpleasant nature of the treatment meted out to us by Chantovic, or just his own pathologically touchy pride, McConnor seemed a completely different man. Red in the face right up to his hairline, nostrils flaring with internal pressure, he was visibly perspiring, and a deep line ran from his compressed lips to the belligerent thrust of his chin. In his eyes, as I saw with concern, was the light of the uncontrolled passion that usually seizes on people only at the roulette table, when they have been constantly doubling their stakes and the right color fails to come up for the sixth or seventh time. At that moment I knew that even if it cost him his entire fortune, this fanatically ambitious man would play and play and play against Chantovic, on his own or with someone else, until he had won at least a single game. If Chantific stayed the course he had found a gold mine in McConnor and could mint a few thousand dollars by the time he reached Buenos Aires, Chantovic was unmoved. By all means, he politely replied, you gentlemen take black this time. The second game went just the same way as the first, except that several curious onlookers had made our circle not just larger but also livelier. 
McConnor was gazing at the board as fixedly as if he intended to magnetize the chessman by his will to win. I sensed that he would happily have given a thousand dollars for the joy of crying checkmate to his cold, insensitive opponent. Curiously, something of his grimly excited determination passed unconsciously to us. Every single move was discussed far more passionately than before. One of us would keep holding the others back at the last moment before we united in giving the signal that brought Chantovic back to our table. Slowly, we had reached the 37th move, and to our own astonishment were in a position that seemed surprisingly advantageous, for we had succeeded in bringing the pawn in file C to the penultimate square C2, we had only to move it to C1 to promote it to a new queen. We didn't in fact feel particularly comfortable about this over-obvious chance. We all suspected that the advantage we appeared to have won must have been intentionally thrown out as bait by Chantovic, whose view of the situation ranged far wider. But despite intensive study and discussion among ourselves, we couldn't see the concealed trick. Finally, as the agreed deadline approached, we decided to risk the move. McConnor had already put out his hand to the pawn to move it to the last square when he felt his arm abruptly taken, while someone whispered quietly and urgently, for God's sake no. We all instinctively turned. A man of about forty-five, whose thin, angular face I had already noticed on the promenade deck because of its strange, almost chalky pallor, must have joined us in the last few minutes as we were landing our entire attention to the problem. He quickly added, Feeling our eyes on him, if you make a queen now, he'll take her at once with the bishop on c1, and yell counter with the knight. But meanwhile he'll take his passed pawn to d7, endangering your rook, and even if you check him with the knight, you'll lose after 9 or 10 moves. It's almost the same combination as Elekhine used against Bogolubov at the Grand Tournament in Pistion in 1922. The surprised McConnor withdrew his hand from the piece and stared in no less amazement than the rest of us at the man who had unexpectedly come to our aid like an angel from heaven. Someone who could work out a checkmate nine moves ahead must be an expert of the first rank, perhaps even a rival for the championship traveling to the same tournament, and his sudden arrival and intervention at this critical moment had something almost supernatural about it. McConnor was the first to pull himself together. What would you advise? He whispered in agitation. I wouldn't advance just yet. It'd take evasive action first. Above all, move the king out of danger from g8 to h7. That will probably make him attack the other flank, but you can parry the attack with rook c8 to c4. It will cost him to tempos, a pawn, and his advantage. Then it's passed pawn against passed pawn, and if you defend properly you can draw with him. You can't get anything better. Yet again we were astonished. There was something bewildering about his precision as well as the speed of his calculations. It was as if he were reading the moves from the pages of a book. But anyway, the unexpected prospect of drawing our game against a grandmaster thanks to his intervention was enchanting. We all moved aside to give him a clear view of the board. McConnor asked again, King g8 to h7, then, yes, yes, evasive action, that's the thing. McConnor complied, and we tapped the glass. Chantovic returned to our table with his usual regular tread, and took in the counter move at a single glance. Then he moved the pawn from h to 2 h from the king's flank, just as our unknown helper had predicted. The man was already whispering urgently, Rook forward, Rook forward, C8 to C4, then he'll have to cover his pawn first. But that won't help him. Ignore his past pawn, move your knight D3 to E5, and the balance will be restored. Keep the pressure on, advance instead of defending. We didn't understand what he meant. As far as we were concerned he might have been speaking Chinese. But once under his spell McConnor moved as he advised without stopping to think about it. We tapped the glass again to call Chantovic back. For the first time, he did not decide on his next move at once, but looked at the board intently. Involuntarily, he drew his brows together. Then he made exactly the move that the stranger had predicted, and turned to walk away. But before he did so, something new and unexpected happened. 
Chantovic looked up and studied our ranks. He obviously wanted to find out who was putting up such energetic resistance all of a sudden. From that moment on our excitement knew no bounds. Up till this moment we had played without any serious hope, but now the idea of breaking through Chantovic's cold pride sent fire flying through all our veins. And our new friend had already told us the next move, so we were able my fingers shook as I tapped the glass with the spoon to call Chantovic back. Now came our first triumph. Chantovic, who until this point had made his moves standing, hesitated, hesitated, and finally sat down. He sat slowly and ponderously, but from the purely physical viewpoint the action cancelled out his condescending attitude towards us so far. We had forced him to come down to our level, at least in spatial terms. He thought for a long time, eyes lowered and intent on the board, so that you could hardly see his pupils under his dark lids, and in his meditations his mouth gradually dropped open, giving his round face a rather simple expression. Chantovic thought for several minutes, then made his move and stood up, and our friend was already whispering, delaying tactics. Good thinking, but don't fall for it. Force an exchange, you must force an exchange, and then we can get a draw and no god will be able to help him. McConnor did as he said. In the next few moves between the two of them the rest of us had long since sunk to the status of mere extras a back and forth procedure that meant nothing at all to us ensued. After about seven moves Chantovic thought for some time, then looked up and said, Game drawn. For a moment there was total silence. We suddenly heard the sound of the waves and the jazz music playing in the saloon. We could hear every step on the promenade deck and the quiet, soft blowing of the wind as it came through the cracks around the portholes. We were hardly breathing, it had happened to suddenly, and all of us were left in shock by the improbable way in which this unknown had forced his will on the world champion in a game that was half lost already. McConnor leaned back with a sudden movement, the breath he had been holding emerged audibly from his lips in a contented awe. Myself, I was watching Chantovic. It seemed to me that during the last few moves he had turned paler, but he was good at keeping control over himself. He persisted in his apparently unruffled composure, and just asked in the most casual of tones, sweeping the chessman off the board with a steady hand, would you gentlemen care for a third game? He asked the question purely objectively, purely as a matter of business. But the remarkable thing was that he had not been looking at McConnor, and instead had raised his eyes to gaze keenly straight at our saviour. Just as a horse recognises a new and better rider by his firmer seat, he must have identified his true, genuine opponent during those last moves. Instinctively, we followed the direction of his eyes, and looked at the stranger in suspense. However, before he could think about it, let alone answer, McConnor in his ambitious excitement was triumphantly calling out to him, of course, but now you must play against him on your own, you against Chantovic. Here, however, something unforeseen happened. The stranger, who curiously enough was still staring hard at the now empty chessboard, started when he felt that all eyes were turned on him and heard us appealing to him so enthusiastically. His expression became confused. Oh, by no means. Gentlemen, he stammered in visible dismay. Quite out of the question, you mustn't think of me for a moment I haven't sat at a chessboard for twenty, no, twenty-five years and only now do I see how improperly I behaved, interfering in your game without asking please excuse my presumption. And before we had recovered from our surprise, he had already turned and left the saloon. But that's impossible, thundered the temperamental McConnor, slamming his fist on the table. The man says he hasn't played chess for twenty-five years. Out of the question. He calculated every move, every counterattack for five or six moves in advance. No one can do that off the calf. It's absolutely impossible, isn't it? With this last question McConnor had instinctively turned to Chantovic. But the world champion remained as cool as ever. I really can't venture an opinion. Anyway... The gentleman played in a rather strange and interesting way, so I gave him a chance on purpose. Rising casually to his feet as he spoke, he added in his matter-of-fact manner, if he, or indeed you gentlemen, would care for another game tomorrow, 
am at your disposal from three in the afternoon. We couldn't suppress a slight smile. All of us knew that Chantovic had definitely not been generous enough to give our unknown helper a chance, and his remark was nothing but a naive excuse to mask his own failure. Our wish to see such unswerving arrogance taken down a pack or to grow all the stronger. Suddenly we peaceable, easygoing passengers were overcome by a wild, overweening lust for battle. The idea that here on this ship, in the middle of the ocean, the palm of victory might be snatched from the chess champion a record that would be flushed all over the world by telegraph officers fascinated us in the most provocative way. And then there was the intriguing mystery arising from our savior's unexpected intervention just at the critical moment, and the contrast between his almost timorous modesty and the professional's unshakable self-confidence. Who was this stranger? Had chance brought a hitherto undiscovered chess genius to light here? Or was a famous master concealing his name from us for some unknown reason? We discussed all these possibilities with great excitement. Even the most audacious hypotheses did not seem to us audacious enough to reconcile the stranger's baffling shyness and surprising protestations with his unmistakable skill. On one point, However, we were all agreed we weren't giving up the spectacular prospect of another encounter. We decided to try every possible means of persuading our helper to play a game against Chantovic the next day. McConnor pledged himself to meet the expanse. Since inquiries put to the steward had by now produced the information that the unknown man was an Austrian, I was charged, as his fellow countryman, to convey our request to him. It didn't take me long to track down the man who had fled in such haste. He was on the promenade deck, reclining in his deck chair and reading. Before going closer, I took the opportunity of observing him. His head with its sharply cut features was resting on the cushion in a slightly weary attitude. Once again I was particularly struck by the strange pallor of his relatively young face framed at the temples by dazzlingly white hair. I don't know why but I had a feeling that this man must have aged very suddenly. I had hardly approached him before he rose courteously and introduced himself by a name that was immediately familiar to me as that of a highly regarded old Austrian family. I remembered that a man of the same name had belonged to the circle of Schubert's most intimate friends, and one of the old emperor's physicians had been a family member too. When I put our request to drive B, Asking him to accept Chantovic's challenge, he was obviously taken aback. It turned out that he had never guessed he had acquitted himself so well in our game against a grandmaster, indeed the most successful grandmaster of all at the time. For some reason the information seemed to make a particular impression on him, for he kept asking again and again whether I was sure that his opponent had really been the acknowledged world champion. I soon realized that this fact made my errand easier and I merely thought it advisable, sensing the delicacy of his feelings, not to tell him that the financial risk of possible defeat would be covered by McConnor's funds. After considerable hesitation, Drive B said he was prepared to play a game, but he expressly asked me to warn the other gentlemen not on any account to expect too much of his skill. For, he added, with the smile of a man lost in thought, I really don't know if I'm capable of playing a game of chess properly by all the rules. Do please believe me, it wasn't false modesty when I said that I haven't touched a chessman since my school days, more than twenty years ago, and even then I was considered only a player of no special talent. He said this in such a natural way that I could not for a moment doubt his honesty. Yet I couldn't help expressing my surprise at the precision with which he could remember every single combination thought up by many different masters. He must at least, I said, have taken a great theoretical interest in the game. Drive B smiled again in that curiously dreamy way. A great theoretical interest. God knows, I can certainly say I've done that. But it was under very special, indeed unprecedented circumstances. It's a rather complicated story, but it could make some slight contribution to the history of these delightful times of ours. If you have half an hour to spare, he had indicated the deck care next to his, and I was happy to accept his invitation. We had no neighbors. Drive B took off his reading glasses, put them aside, and began, You were kind enough to say that, as a Viennese yourself, 
you remembered the name of my family, but I don't suppose you will have heard of the legal practice that I ran with my father and later on my own, since we didn't deal with the kinds of cases that attracted newspaper publicity and we avoided taking new clients on principle. In fact, we didn't really have an ordinary legal practice anymore. We confined ourselves entirely to giving legal advice to the great monasteries and in particular administering their property. As a former parliamentary deputy of the clerical party, my father was close to them. In addition, and now that the monarchy is past history, I suppose this can be mentioned management of the funds of several members of the imperial family was entrusted to us. These links with the court and the clergy my uncle was the emperor's physician. Another of the family was abbot of Seitenstetten went back to generations. All we had to do was maintain them, and this inherited trust involved us in a quiet, I might even say silent form of activity, not really calling for much more than the strictest discretion and reliability to qualities that my late father possessed to a very high degree. Through his circumspection, he succeeded in preserving considerable assets for his clients both in the inflationary years and at the time of the coup. When Hitler came to the helm in Germany and began raiding the assets of the church and the monasteries, many negotiations and transactions on the German side of the border also passed through our hands. They were designed to save movable property at least from confiscation, and we both knew more about certain political dealings by the Curia and the Imperial House than the public will ever hear about. But the inconspicuous nature of our legal office we didn't even have a breastplate outside the door as well as our caution, for we both carefully avoided all monarchist circles, were in themselves the best protection against investigation from the wrong quarters. In all those years, in fact, none of the authorities in Austria ever suspected that the secret couriers of the Imperial House always collected and handed in their most important correspondence at our modest fourth-floor premises. But the National Socialists, long before arming their forces against the world, had begun to muster another equally dangerous and well-trained army in all the countries bordering on their territory, the Legion of the Underprivileged of people who had been passed over or who bore a grudge. They had their so-called cells in every office and every business company, their spies and listening posts were everywhere, all the way to the private offices of Dolphus and Shashnik, and they had their men, as unfortunately I discovered only too late, even in our own modest legal practice. He was no more than a poor, untalented clerk whom I had offered a job at a priest's request simply to give the office the outward appearance of an ordinary firm. In reality, we used him only to run innocent errands, let him answer the telephone and do the filing, that's to say, the filing of entirely harmless and important paperwork. He was never allowed to open the post. I typed all important letters myself, never making copies. I took every important document home and conducted secret discussions only in the monastery priory or my uncle's consulting rooms. Thanks to these precautions, the listening post saw none of our important dealings, but through an unfortunate accident the vain, ambitious fellow must have noticed that we didn't trust him and that all kinds of interesting things were going on behind his back. Perhaps in my absence one of the couriers had once incautiously mentioned his majesty instead of the agreed pseudonym of Baron Fern. Or perhaps the wretched man had been opening letters on the sly at any rate. Before I suspected him of anything, Munich or Berlin had instructed him to keep watch on us. Only much later, long after my rest, did I remember how his original lackluster approach to his work had turned to sudden eagerness in the last few months, and he had several times almost importunately offered to take my letters to the post. So I can't absolve myself of a certain incautiousness, but after all, weren't the best of diplomats and military men taken in by Hitler's insidious tricks. The close, indeed loving attention the Gestapo had been paying me over a long period was made evident by the fact that on the very evening when Shushnik announced his resignation, I had already been arrested by us men. Luckily, I had managed to burn the most important of our papers as soon as I heard Shushnik's resignation speech on the radio. And as for the remaining documents, 
with the indispensable certificates for the foreign investments of the monasteries and to archdukes. I sent them to my uncle, hidden in a laundry basket and taken away by my trustworthy old housekeeper literally at the last minute, just before my door was broken down. Drive B stopped to light a cigar. In the flickering light I saw a nervous tick at the right-hand corner of his mouth which I had noticed before and which recurred every few minutes. It was only a fleeting movement, not much more than the ghost of one, but it gave a curious look of unrest to his entire face. You probably think I'm going to tell you about the concentration camps where everyone who kept faith with our old Austria was taken, about the humiliations, torments and tortures that I suffered there. But nothing of that nature happened. I was in a different category. I wasn't herded together with those poor souls who suffered physical and mental degradation as resentments long nurtured were vanted on them. I was put into that other, very small group from which the Nazis hoped to extract either money or important information. In itself, of course my modest person was of no interest to the Gestapo, but they must have discovered that we had been the front man, administrators and intimates of their bitterest enemy, and what they hoped to get out of me was incriminating material. Material to be used against the monasteries which they wanted to prove had been sequestrating property evidence against the imperial family and all in Austria who sacrificed themselves in support of the monarchy. They suspected, and to be honest, not incorrectly that considerable amounts of the funds which had passed through our hands were still hidden away safe from their rapacity. So they brought me in at the earliest opportunity to force these secrets out of me. Using their tried and trusted methods, people in my category, from whom important evidence or money was to be extracted, were not sent to concentration camps but kept for special processing. You may remember that our Chancellor and Baron Rothschild, from whose family they hoped to extort millions, were not put behind barbed wire in a prison camp, but had what looked like preferential treatment and were taken to a hotel, the Hotel Metropole which was also the Gestapo headquarters and where each had a room of his own. Insignificant as I was, I received the same mark of distinction. A room of your own in a hotel it sounds very humane, doesn't it? However, you may believe me if I tell you that when we prominent people were not crammed into an icy hut twenty at a time, but accommodated in reasonably well-heated private hotel rooms, they had in store for us a method which was not at all more humane just more sophisticated, for the pressure they intended to exert, to get the material they needed out of us, was to operate more subtly than through crude violence and physical torture. The method was the most exquisitely refined isolation. Nothing was done to us, we were simply placed in a complete void, and everyone knows that nothing on earth exerts such pressure on the human soul as a void. Solitary confinement in a complete vacuum, a room hermetically cut off from the outside world, was intended to create pressure not from without, through violence and the cold, but from within, and to open our lips in the end. At first sight the room I was given didn't seem at all uncomfortable. It had a door, a bed, an armchair, a wash basin, a barred window, but the door was locked day and night, no book, newspaper, sheet of paper or pencil might lie on the table. The window looked out on a firewall. A complete void had been constructed around myself and even my own body. Everything had been taken from me, my watch, so that I wouldn't know the time, my pencil, so that I couldn't write anything, my pank knife, to prevent me from opening my veins, even the smallest narcotic such as a cigarette was denied me. Apart from the jailer, who spoke not a word and wouldn't answer any questions, I never saw a human face and I never heard a human voice. In that place your eyes, ears and all the other senses had not the slightest nourishment from morning to night and from night to morning. You were left irredeemably alone with yourself, your body, and the four or five silent objects. Table, bed, window, wash basin. You lived like a diver under a glass dome in the black ocean of this silence. And even worse. Like a diver who already guesses that the cable connecting him to the world outside has broken and he will never be pulled up from those soundless depths. There was nothing to do, nothing to hear, nothing to see. You were surrounded everywhere, 
all the time by the void, that entirely spaceless, timeless vacuum. You walked up and down, and your thoughts went up and down with you, up and down, again and again. But even thoughts, insubstantial as they may seem, need something to fix on, or they begin to rotate and circle aimlessly around themselves. They can't tolerate a vacuum either. You kept waiting for something from morning to evening, and nothing happened. You waited again, and yet again, nothing happened. You waited, 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 you thought, you thought, you thought until your head was aching. Nothing happened. You were left alone, alone, alone. I lived like this for two weeks, outside time, outside the world. If a war had broken out during that time I wouldn't have heard about it. For my world consisted only of table, door, bed, wash basin, chair, window and wall. And I kept staring at the same wallpaper on the same wall. I stared at it so often that every line of its zigzag pattern has etched itself on the innermost folds of my brain as if with an engraver's baron. Then, at last, the interrogations began. You were suddenly summoned, without really knowing whether it was day or night. You were fetched and led along a few corridors to you didn't know where, then you waited somewhere, again you didn't know where, and suddenly you were standing in front of a table with a few men in uniform sitting round it. A pile of papers lay on the table, files, containing you didn't know what, and then the questions began, real and false, obvious and deceptive, cover-up questions and trick questions, and while you replied strange, Malicious fingers leafed through the papers containing you didn't know what, and strange, malicious fingers wrote something in the record of the interrogation, and you didn't know what they were writing. 